hi everyone and thank you for the invitation to speak it's nice to see some familiar and some new faces as well um i think this actually feeds quite nicely on from andy and chrissy's presentation at the last um knowledge exchange thinking about local authorities and we're going to think a bit more broadly today around integrated care systems and population health management so i get quite a few queries as to what population health management is and um, particularly from academic colleagues around integrated care system development and evolution and how in particular population health management fits into existing population health work and what particularly is new about it today. Um, so hopefully today I'll be able to shed some light on this. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction to integrated care systems and where they're at at the moment. I'll then give an overview of population health management and as this is a particularly thinking about uh, population evidence and data science, I'll give a brief overview of the analytical approaches um, with a couple of examples. And then I'll finish off with a bit on the recent strategic and policy documents that have come out to just show where the future direction is going. And then in the conversation bit at the end, it'd be really great to hear people's thoughts as I'm conscious we've got a range of perspectives on the call today. Um, and also how people see this going in the future and if there are any particular outstanding questions as well that we can look to support at a regional level, um, helping to answer or at least hope to answer in the future. So integrated care systems. So this is looking at the shift from um, competitive based healthcare and organisational autonomy, looking to a more collaborative process and looking to work together to integrate services and improve population health. So their official definition is they're geographically based partnerships. They're bringing together providers and commissioners of NHS services with other um, community organisations. So local authorities, other local partners, such as voluntary community sector colleagues, and this is very much to plan, coordinate and commission health and care services. So it's looking at um, integrated health and care and how we can shift that and expand that to look to support population health systems. So considering from individuals up to populations and then thinking of expanding from service provision to how this looks to address health and well-being. So you can see this box on the bottom left here, the four main objectives of integrated care systems. So number one, it's improving population health and healthcare, then tackling unequal outcomes and access, enhancing productivity and value for money, and helping the NHS to support broader social and economic development. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, we've got six ICSs across the east of England, as outlined here. And for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you'll notice uh, some organisations that we have in the region, they will overlap multiple integrated care systems. So thinking about, for example, Essex-based organisations, they will have the challenge of spanning across three of the ICSs. And indeed, some of the southern ones will span across into London ICSs as well, in terms of where those services overlap. So this is a helpful diagram which the King's Fund have produced. Um, so the date you'll see it's from April 2022, that date shifted now until July of 2022 due to COVID and in particular the Omicron pressures over the winter. Um, but this gives a nice overview of um, the structure of if they do become statutory from July onwards, how this looks and how this looks at a geographical level as well. So there's two main components to the integrated care system. There's the integrated care board, um, which for those of you familiar with clinical commissioning groups, this is where they will move into. So it's looking at allocating NHS budget and commissioning the particular services that they are responsible and looking to produce the five year system plan for the health services. This will um, work in close alignment with the integrated care partnership um, and this has a broader reach so it's looking at uh, representatives oops, sorry uh, representatives from um, broader community colleagues so local authorities uh, health watch and other partners and their role is to really start to meet the wider health public health and social care needs they will look to develop and lead the integrated care strategy but they won't be commissioning services and the geographical footprint is something that's quite crucial here to then look at what particular services and organisations will be delivering at what particular levels and really supporting this overall strategic shift towards um, place based working. So we have our system, the integrated care system, which usually covers a population of one to two million. Uh, this will go down to a more local level termed place where you have these place based partnerships um, and the existing health and wellbeing boards as well. And then you'll go 
even more geographical um, defined to the neighborhood level where it's you'll have your primary care networks and operations so comprising uh, primary care colleagues from general practice community pharmacy dentistry and opticians for example um, so this document, some of you may have seen, was published last week. Um, I'm still working through the numerous pages on it, but I think this figure is really helpful, actually, to just show how it's continually evolving and how this um, structure looks to fit in, particularly with the national um, and regional and local accountability as well. So you'll see at the centre, you've got the integrated care system with your integrated care boards and partnerships and how that aligns across to local government. And then more prominently featured is this place level. Um, where it typically maps to the local authority level um, and increasing kind of information coming out on where that accountability sits. So having either pooled or aligned budgets and then linking funding to these uh, more localised levels and particular services. So primary, primary and community care services, primary care networks, mental health services, adult social care providers and hospital and other healthcare services. So that's the general landscape at the moment, um, and it is still um, kind of subject to ongoing review and evolution. Uh, but I thought I'd delve into a bit more about population health and how population health management features in this integrated care system development as well. Um, so just for a reminder on the call for people who are familiar and for those who aren't familiar with the distinction, um, we're going to take the King's Fund definition around population health. So generally, it's an approach uh, that aims to improve physical and mental outcome, mental health outcomes, promote well-being and reduce health inequalities across an entire population. And it has a particular focus on the wider determinants of health and the role of people yeah. in communities. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you, um, you may be familiar with this figure at the bottom here, sure. so in Whitehead. Oh, I don't know if someone, if you're not on mute, if you could mute yourself. Thank you. Right. Yeah, um, nice. And it's thinking about those different uh, levels of factors that impact so on an individual's in health and well being. Did, did you put milk in it? I'm just thinking if there's a way to mute. Mm, I'll carry on. Um, and looking at those wider factors that impact on an individual's health and well being. Um, so you have the individual factors, such as age and sex, you then have uh, the wider individual lifestyle factors social and community networks, and these particular elements here. Um, so in, labelled in green, so you have housing, healthcare services, water and sanitation, etc. Um, but this just nicely highlights that healthcare services are only one element um, of what supports an individual's health and wellbeing. On the right here, there's a nice diagram just highlighting some of the key characteristics of a population health system, so a system supporting um, good population health. So we have the integrated health and care system at the bottom, which we just talked about, and then to consider the wider determinants of health, um, individual health behaviours and lifestyles, and then the places and communities in which we live in and with. So that's population health um, and population health management is really a particular approach to how we look to improve population health. So it's focusing on um, targeted initiatives using linked data. So it's using linked data to plan and deliver proactive and preventative care to achieve the maximum impact on the health of a population. And it's really seen, as you can see on this figure on the right here, be a key enabler for how integrated care systems can look to support better population health outcomes, experience and value for the health and care systems. So it's an approach to look to understand current and predict future health and care needs. And it's using historical and current data to understand what factors are driving poor outcomes in different population groups. It includes several particular analytical approaches. Um, so population segmentation, risk stratification and impactability modeling approaches to identify local at-risk cohorts to prioritize. Once these cohorts are identified, it's then aligned with designing new either proactive models of care or targeting existing models of care to improve health and well-being today as well as in the future for those cohorts. And when we're talking about health and care, we're considering the wider definition of health. So linking to the previous um, slide and thinking about those wider determinants of health. So the key aims are to prevent ill health in the first place, to improve care and support for people with ongoing health conditions, and to reduce these unwanted, unwarranted variations in outcomes for people when they are using health services and with their health conditions. So it, it helps us understand our current health and care needs and predict what local people will need in the future. 
Um, although this is started off as an NHS initiative, it's meant to be used by everyone working in health and care and considering the wider picture. So commissioners, providers, local government, public health and the voluntary sector. It helps us to target health inequalities in local communities, improve people's health and well-being, and support the needs of each individual. And how it particularly differs um, from what's been done already, it's very much focused on using these linked data sets and the particular analytical techniques for these data sets to then analyse populations more effectively and by identifying more targeted um, cohorts of individuals and more targeted approaches to services and interventions that are offered. So individuals can be contacted and proactively offered the relevant help and support. So it can be used as part of a whole system approach to support prevention. Um, so we have the prevention, um, the stages of the prevention pathway here, which some of you will be familiar with. So at the bottom, thinking about those wider socioeconomic determinants, which I've mentioned in a couple of slides. So using it to understand what makes communities or individuals susceptible to poor health. It can then be used to look at uh, primary prevention, so identifying disease risk factors to inform preventative action before a disease is present, such as smoking cessation. Then on to early detection of disease, so for example, looking at variation in screening uptake and who is not presenting to screening to identify those who may benefit from a more proactive approach. And then finally for condition management and tertiary prevention, so thinking about those with the diagnosed conditions who would benefit with an intervention that would support them to be as healthy as they can. So there's five overall aims of population health management. So it starts with the original triple aim for healthcare. So looking to enhance the experience of care, improve the health and well-being of the population and reduce the per capita cost of healthcare and improve productivity. And it also has two important additional aims. So looking to address health and care inequalities and increase the well-being and engagement of the wider health and care workforce. So PHM is quite a Kind of diverse approach in the sense of the skills that were required um, and the different stages in the system and in the organization and the different professional groups who will be involved. So we typically present uh, PHM in these particular uh, categories of four eyes, so infrastructure, intelligence, interventions and incentives, and some of our systems have also started to have another one which is defined as impact. So in order to support uh, PHM and start to progress it, uh, starting with the infrastructure, so it's having those um, digitized health and care records and having the common integrated health and care record, and then the architecture to then support that linked health and care data um, with the support from information governance and the wider system support from the organizational and human perspective to start to um, explore and develop PHM. Once you have your linked data sets established, there's then the intelligence element. So how is this data converted to actionable intelligence for use? So you need to consider the analytical tools and software, um, what analyses and the actual insight that will result from that. And then also how you're going to bring together these teams to best utilize um, your knowledge of the data sets that you have and pull your analytical expertise. So there's development of um, bringing together an intelligence function from the range of organizations within an integrated care system and the alignment of these multidisciplinary analytical teams and existing quality improvement teams that are present within organizations. Once you've then got your intelligence and your insight of who to target and how best to target them, there's then thinking about expanding on that how best to target them. So what particular interventions would be helpful? So thinking about care model and design through proactive and anticipatory care models with a focus on prevention and early intervention and reducing health inequalities. And then also thinking about um, community initiatives, the asset based approach um, initiatives such as social prescribing, which are really crucial to supporting PHM and how best to meaningfully involve citizens for improved co-production. And importantly, how best to monitor and evaluate any initiatives that are tried out to then feed into that continuous improvement. And this is um, supported by the relevant incentives, so um, aligning to kind of population based incentives and considering what workforce development is required and what governance is able to support this more flexible working. So there's quite a lot of different elements involved in this um, and it's this cycle here which again will be familiar of you those to you particularly working in healthcare or kind of public health initiatives where you're looking to understand your population health and care needs, 
you're then looking at an opportunity analysis to work out which particular needs you want to prioritize and then carry out um, the kind of core PHM analytical areas. So um, those particular techniques with the linked data to identify those particular cohorts you really want to target. There's then doing predictive system modeling of how best you want to target those particular groups and their needs. And then looking to match that to the relevant evidence available on what could work um, to then try out the new intervention or modifying the care pathway and then looking to evaluate that and being supportive of any rapid improvements as you're looking and trialing it out and looking to expand it up if relevant. So the first step in this is um, it's really kind of drawing on the expertise that's already in the system and um, the many resources and tools that are already existing um, for what we know the key health and care issues affecting local populations are. Um, so, as outlined here, this may be already available at a place geography in the form of a joint strategic needs assessment and uh, within the constituent CCGs and local authorities, there'll be various um, intelligence outputs and needs assessments to really identify what we know um, the health and care issues are. And then uh, some integrated care systems and organisations are producing population health profiles as well. So for particular areas, so for example, going down to primary care network level, really mapping out those indicators of what are the key health concerns um, and health needs for our population in this particular area, and what are the key things that differ and are perhaps unique in this particular population area. We then look um, so to kind of the work with the linked data sets, and I've deliberately kept this quite broad at this stage because um, there's a lot of detail we could go into, but essentially it's looking at um, linking across, in the first instance, it's primary and secondary care data and mental health data, um, and then looking to expand that out to social care data, and then looking to expand out to um, other local authority data sets. Now, this is just coming from the NHS perspective, as um, Andy mentioned in the last seminar, there's been some good work done already within local authorities on linking their um, relevant data sets and um, using it to help identify uh, particular areas where um, there could be additional benefits made. So, for example, looking at um, domestic abuse survivors and linking the relevant data sets there to um, highlight particular area, areas in the pathway that could be targeted. So this is really kind of trying to bring together these different, um, so coming from the NHS and integrating data sets there and then coming from local authorities and integrating data sets there and the wider partners and bringing it all together into one um, integrated data set so we could really look across um, an individual's journey um, and that whole kind of prevention pathway from pre-disease through to developing disease through to end of life. And these are the stages and the particular questions that we're looking to answer. Um, so when you're looking to start off with, you're looking at population segmentation. So how can I specify my population group that I'm interested in? You're then looking at risk stratification. So who within that population group of interest is most likely to need an intervention? So who's most at risk of developing an adverse outcome? And then impactability modelling. So for those who are most at risk, how can we impact these people and what effect might we see? So with segmentation, it's grouping uh, the population into groups based on identified criteria and really helping to understand what the distinctive needs are for different groups within the population. Um, and that will then link into providing intelligence to then help to tailor care to these people's interdependent needs. Ideally, you'd want to do it, it would be unique to each individual, um, but this obviously isn't practical. So we use um, different characteristics by which to group by. And you can see an example on the box on the right here. Um, so you can look at it on the basis of clinical characteristics, particularly geographical area. Um, it could be purely data driven, um, or you could specify demographic characteristics or a combination of the above. And at an individual level, you can use this to facilitate the delivery of personalized care. But what we're interested in at a population level is how we can really plan those system level interventions based on the particular cohorts that we see within our system. So this is just an example of um, from the company out from Space Healthcare using the bridges to health segmentation model of some of the categories that are used. So it's split into the top on those core population groups um, and the bottom for people who would move into out of these categories with episodic care needs. So requirements at a period of time for maternal and infant health and if they're acutely ill. 
um, but the main categories are at the top as well. So you've got that initial healthy group, and then you're looking at progression into uh, perhaps having long-term conditions, um, some of which may develop into serious disability, and then looking at those different stages towards the end phases of life. And another reason this is helpful is to really um, try and understand the different um, outcomes that are important to these different groups. Um, and these outcomes will differ between these groups. So typically in healthcare at the minute, when we're looking at um, population based outcomes, it's looking collectively at that population. So um, reducing A&E attendance, for example, more generally. It, we did need separate and um, kind of tailored outcomes for these different groups. So people who have never utilised services before, the focus would be on primary prevention to stay well. For people who are generally fit and well, the focus would be on access to high quality, effective and efficient services. And then as you progress more into the long term conditions and complex comorbidities, it would then be supporting around multidisciplinary teams working to maintain quality of life and helping to support stay well and prevent complications. And it's as well starting to think about what outcomes really matter to people um, and to try and understand what is meaningful and thinking about meaningful to both patients, but also um, care and service providers as well. So you've got your um, population cohort, you then want to understand within that group who is most likely to need an intervention. So who is at greatest risk of having a significant health event or at significant risk of deterioration? So we can use it to prevent, uh, sorry, to predict adverse events that are undesirable, costly, and potentially preventable. Um, there's a wide range that could be predicted in a wide range of time windows. So that's um, down to kind of modeling and decisions to work out um, what is needed and what should be approached. It's seen as one form of segmentation. So it's looking at um, splitting your cohort into smaller cohorts of people with similar characteristics. It can be used at both um, a population level and a case finding level. So we're looking at um, these depersonalized link data sets to understand the patterns and distribution of risk uh, within your particular population group. It would then also be used at an individual level for case finding purposes. So for example, once you've um, identified a particular individual who is at a particular level of risk, you can look to identify amongst, for example, your GP practice population and see who is at a higher risk um, for developing an adverse outcome. And you could then look to um, offer a preventative intervention or look to kind of prioritise access if there's, for example, a limited number of spaces at a particular point in time. Traditionally, uh, regression analysis has been used for risk stratification, um, but increasingly machine learning and neural network techniques are being applied and uh, researched at the minute to see how this can um, look to kind of inform it. And as acknowledged here, the real strength of this is looking at data wider than acute data. So a number of risk stratification approaches at the moment look on a particular data set. What we're interested in is that linked data across an individual's life to then see what are these particular factors reaching out from their clinical activity and thinking about some of their wider characteristics to see if there's anything that we could look to target um, in a more collaborative way across conditions. I've mentioned here a number of practical considerations. For those of you who have worked in risk stratification before, um, there's a number of considerations thinking about uh, what particular level you'd want to target. So for example, it wouldn't be those necessarily at the highest level of risk, you'd want to go one step below and look at those who are at the rising risk. So you're at that point at which you could really start to target um, and make an impact and hopefully prevent them from moving into that high risk stage. And then finally, impactability modelling. Now, this is something that um, actuarial organisations in particular have experience in, and there's ongoing research at the moment with, and working collaboratively with them to work out on how this is applied best to population health management. But what we're trying to look at is how can we impact these people who we've identified in that particular population group and who's at an increased risk and what effect might we see? And this is um, on the basis that so risk stratification tools will predict future risk, but they do not directly predict where the greatest improvement opportunities lie. Um, there's an additional step that's required to identify those individuals who would be amenable to the interventions required. So it's used to understand the likelihood of it having a successful impact upon that subpopulation and what effect the impact might be. So as outlined here, we've got some definitions. So the degree to which different subpopulations will benefit from a range of interventions, 
And then importantly, it's how this is used to tailor appropriate interventions within the agreed boundaries for the values gained from resource spent. And what this means is picking a value of interest, which if you remember the five key aims of population health management, it's picking one of those and then seeing with this particular approach and targeting this particular population group, what is the best way to combine what we have to then have, um, so for example, an increased improvement in population health and well-being, um, and then increased efficiency of spend. And this figure illustrates it quite nicely. Um, so on the left here, you've got, um, after you've risk stratified, so you've got your population at low risk and then increasing risk um, over time. And then on the right here, if you're looking at particular interventions, it doesn't necessarily mean that all individuals in the high risk group will be amenable and will respond well to that particular intervention you offer. Um, this will be based on a range of other characteristics. And so it's again a way of splitting down and working out how best could you apply. Um, now, some of you may have uh, picked up that when thinking about this from a health inequalities perspective, there may be some potential issues here. So, for example, groups who may be amenable to a particular intervention are more likely to respond, take it up um, and have improved outcomes as a result. And um, they may be the group who also are at risk of um, not responding generally um, and resulting from kind of widening health inequalities and actually be that group that we'd want to particularly target. Uh, so I think health inequalities need to be explicitly considered in this. Um, and this is part of the work uh, that the actuarial organisations are starting to include and embed in. And there's work being done to build on, uh, so for example, the Wilson and Younger criteria for screening when considering about the potential, um, as well as the potential benefits, the potential harms of this approach and how to explicitly include um, health inequalities in this particular approach. And it links in as well to the uh, important assessments that we do anyway when we think about uh, new services and interventions, so health um, inequality impact assessments as an example. So that's quite a kind of um, regimented approach in how um, the kind of analytical process pans out. Um, there's obviously a lot of hard work then to then think about how we can look to implement what we find once we've identified the right intervention um, and the group to target and the reasons why we're doing that. So I just wanted to outline um, a particular approach to this and how organisations and systems are starting to look at this now. Um, so although it's linked data dependent, um, there's some work we can start to do with existing data and even small scale linked data as well uh, to see how, um, how we can test out this process and what we can learn from it and start to scale it up. Um, so the link at the bottom here is a really nice case study um, from a social prescribing colleague and her experience of it, which I think brings it to life a bit. Um, but what we're seeing in, uh, say, for example, primary care networks is they're looking to pilot uh, PHM approaches. So they have a couple of linked data sets um, through their local needs assessments and colleagues, particularly from uh, local authority settings, have identified key priorities of interest. They then identify through um, risk stratification approaches and population segmentation approaches uh, their particular cohort. And an example of this is um, taking the kind of key outcome of interest of heart failure and looking to see what particular risk factors would um, predict an increased risk of developing heart failure. And it's thinking about um, individual characteristics such as age, um, other clinical conditions, um, but also taking into account factors such as um, social isolation um, and housing conditions and the kind of broader socioeconomic um, factors impacting on their day to day life. These um, findings and these particular criteria are then brought to a multidisciplinary group and health and care professionals. Um, so that would be clinicians, um, public health colleagues, um, analysts to be able to kind of interpret and talk through the data and colleagues such as social prescribers, which was in this particular example. They then come up with an approach. Um, so to take the social prescribing example, with this particular cohort, you've got a list of individuals who you would um, proactively contact. So rather than waiting for individuals to um, come to a GP or come to a medical colleague and express a concern and then be referred on to social prescribers, they would then be proactively contacting these people um, on the GP practice register who had been identified in this cohort to then follow up with them and better link in to the different range of services. Another example is looking at people at risk of developing complications of diabetes 
and the known overlap between um, poor mental health um, following diagnosis of diabetes as well, and the interrelatedness between uh, poor mental health and then the impact on physical health as well. So another um, group found that uh, by recruiting social prescribers to proactively contact these individuals and increase awareness and education around um, mental health and an impact on physical health, this was supporting people to better manage their health and better understand uh, the interrelatedness and how they could look to address and support that. It's then looking to then come up with some of these particular outcomes and the aims that are really um, what the patient wants, what the individual wants, and then also what um, the system would like. So at the system level, we take those kind of five aims of population health management, but it's also looking from a patient perspective, such as um, having the energy to carry out day to day activities um, and feeling able to kind of keep up employment and particular outcomes like that. So on kind of a small scale um, cycle, that's uh, what's being kind of piloted in some primary care networks with a view to then scaling up. I think one of the big um, areas of conversation over the next 12 months or so is then thinking actually what, what do we need, what particular analytics do we need um, at the different geographical levels within these integrated care systems. And this is a, a starting figure that was published about a year or so ago, I think, just to start to think through some of these particular decisions and questions that we'd see at the different levels. So looking um, at the more kind of strategic level of using it to allocate resources across providers, then looking down to see a bit more, why are we seeing variation between these otherwise perhaps similar primary care network populations? What might be the cause? And then what priority cohort of people can we make the biggest impact on in the next six months? And then linking explicitly to what particular analytics could help to answer those particular level, uh, questions. And this is all wrapped up in um, a number of policy documents that have come out recently and guidance documents. And just to give you an overview of um, showing kind of where the direction is going and that population health management is really quite heavily featured in um, most of these upcoming guidance uh, topics. So we had uh, published just before Christmas, the um, priorities and operational planning guidance for the NHS for 2022-23, um, where PHM was really um, mentioned quite prominently of working strongly alongside local authorities and other partners uh, to support PHM and kind of broader prevention initiatives, including health inequalities and a clear mention of systems to develop plans to put the relevant system skills and data safeguards in place for this. Um, as I mentioned, so you need the linked data underpinning it, and that's quite a big um, technological project, which has already been ongoing in most ICSs, um, but it's starting to develop that technical capability. And as I mentioned, kind of starting with primary and secondary care data, and then expanding out to those data sets and starting to use that to redesign care pathways and measure outcomes. That's NHS operational. We've then got um, from the uh, data and technology side of things um, what good looks like, which is the digital transformation um, future kind of document. And again, featured very heavily as one of the key outcomes there for healthy populations um, with digital and transformation colleagues looking to lead the delivery and development of an ICS wide intelligence platform. Um, and this will look to enable some of the analytical approaches that I've mentioned and look to enable population health management and an increasing focus on the use of data and analytics and ensuring the right people have access to the right type of data to allow the right type of analytics at those different levels. And I wanted to mention these two points at the bottom as well, I'm conscious this is um, kind of a researchers forum and bringing together academics and um, academia is also featured prominently in this. So looking to make this data available to support uh, clinical trials, and then also to look to drive the digital and data innovation. Um, collaborations with academia and industry and other partners are prominently featured in this guidance as well. And then the government's proposal for health and care integration, so the white paper that was published last week, again, featured very strongly um, and the role of data informed decision making um, within ICSs and health and care organisations, again, featured very prominently. Um, so a requirement to put in place systems to link and combine data um, to enable improve both direct care, but also better analytics for population health management. 
And there was a bit more clarification on the relative roles within the integrated care systems and how this will work. So it's the ICBs who are expected to agree a plan for embedding PHM capabilities and ensuring they're supported by the necessary data and digital infrastructure. Um, and then how ICSs will use population health management. And the key importance of, although we're starting with um, primary and secondary care data sets, to look to link in with these wider data sets and looking to include the wider determinants of health and including information on people's living circumstances. So the examples of um, homelessness and social isolation was given. And I just wanted to reiterate that there's a strong role for academia and research in population health management and integrated care system development. And these are some of the points that I just initially thought about and it's open for discussion at the end of this session. But I think, as you would have seen, the need for research, um, coming up with defined questions, um, analytical and evaluation skills will become increasingly important um, in supporting kind of ICS data informed decision making. I think working with linked data sets as well. Um, so there's some quite strong expertise within um, uh, academic institutions and uh, relative researchers around working with linked data. And I think the sharing of learning for insights and some of the nuances of that will be really important. And then also just thinking generally around um, evidence around the population and risk factors, and then also around implementation of population health initiatives as well to support the experience of um, the organizations who are already members. And I'm just flagged here on the right. Um, so this was in the white paper published last week, an example of some of the questions that nationally they're looking to get answers to. So thinking about um, the broader remit of integrated care, um, um, how outcomes can look to support that and this by virtue of this the kind of population health management outcomes how this will link into it as well so thinking about how outcomes can be used to support that common purpose um, between the partners and support the different organizations working together as well So it's quite, um, it's a developing area um, and it's being referenced, as I mentioned, in a number of key strategic documents. Um, so I lead on a work programme across the East of England and I just wanted to acknowledge the range of organisations that I work across and with um, who are working on developing population health management capacity and capability. And um, I'm happy to pick up any particular elements of the local work programme in the chat after this. Um, but otherwise, I think I'll leave that for now. And I think I hope that's been a helpful overview. Um, I'm conscious there's a lot of material covered. So welcome any questions or if anyone wants any clarification or follow up of any particular points.